You guys seem to really like that Nine Realms video. Thank you to everyone who watched it, it was incredible to see it blow up, and of course that growth would not have been possible without the insanely kind shout out from Audrey, so thank you all so much once again, and to her, please definitely do go check out her channel after this video. If some of the pacing sounds wrong, please do forgive me, the script was finished before season 3 released, and then I decided to change up a few of the characters to match what actually happens in the new season. Anyways, I really hope you enjoy. For this video, I'm looking for the characters with the most realistic feeling development and the most organic feeling actions. Let's start with cutting off some of the side characters. I'll also not be including any of the dragons because none of them have a half interesting personality that I think could contest. Apart from maybe the Fault Ripper who's been emotionally traumatized. I'm excluding the three brothers, Ford, Winston, and Dude. Angela, D'Angelo's mum. Linda, because not only could she defend this 14 year old kid who saved her life, but also because she's just unnecessarily rude. Just let her fall. As much as I'd love to keep Carla and Hazel because they're potentially the most on-the-ball characters, I really can't because of how little they actually appear. We could fertilize the garden with that good boy act. And the bit of development they do have with the Fireworm and Alex happens so fast and is resolved so quickly, it may as well not have happened at all. I think Audrey said it best in her Season 1 review. They all look like plastic action figures and none of them have been rendered to the same quality as Tom. Not only are the characters deprived of motivations and realistic feeling actions, but also with their appearance on screen. But rather than I tell you what she thought, maybe she could tell you herself. D'Angelo's parents and Alex's mothers are, again, so one note I can't even critique them. That'd be like me being an art critic and someone asking me to decipher a blank canvas. There's just absolutely nothing there. Philip wrote himself off in the first episode when he got annoyed at Tom for saving someone's life, and then also beforehand when he kept pushing Alex to give an answer, when not only could he see all four of the kids, but his dumbass register also had a picture of all of them too. He's on more of a power trip than this entire facility. Although to give him credit where it's due, he does begin to respect Tom a little more after D'Angelo tells him about how he's been a good friend and whatever else. And he does seem to pick out Eugene's lies pretty quick, so maybe he's not so bad. Have you finished your chores, Eugene? <laughs> no. Sledkin was so strange in season 1 and 2, her antagonist personality felt so forced, and this is quite similar in season 3. I feel like there's a bit more acknowledgement between her and Olivia, and there's maybe some more common ground. They don't have to be best buds, but maybe something like Hiccup and Vigo would just be nice, where they can just accept each other's strengths and maybe find something to work off in the end. Sled Bitch is the most one-dimensional villain character you could possibly come up with. She may as well be the backplate of this scene. So that leaves us with these idiots. May is just as annoying as her daughter. All right, let's head to the fissure. Ah, hat? Thomas. And literally every one of my Asian friends who've seen the show have told me she's so stereotypical, it's borderline offensive. Let's ignore the whole comment with the polar bear thing in episode one, because I seriously can't with these adults three minutes into season one. Thomas! Your mother. So, Olivia might be a witch. I'm not a professional or anything, but this helicopter does seem to be moving very quickly and is very close to the ground in these trees. Nice motion blur on the sheet, by the way. Similar to her son, I'll get to him soon enough, don't you worry. Parts of her just seem to not work. Did you notice the part where the, the monstrous nightmare was missing its horns? No. No. What? Yeah! <laughs> yeah. So Guys, these are the I same guess. people who turned a black guy white for an entire scene. You really think that this is beneath them? Although she is seen playing with Tom and doing other things with him, especially that cave expedition where she makes a special exception just to spend time with him. Bad parenting? Perhaps. Olivia is a negligent mother. I don't care how many times they crack at her being trendy and relatable with her son. If I had a dollar for every time he almost died on her watch, I'd have enough money to buy out DreamWorks and fix this catastrophe of a series myself. Maybe she cares a little too much because she later tries to educate her four other co-workers on climate change. What started it? Years of drought. Climate change has turned this forest into a tinderbox. James Charles has some character growth in season three, but it pretty much all rides on the back of his and June's relationship. And I'll reiterate, June's character depth is akin to a shit stain in a gas station urinal. He goes from being a stuck-up, arrogant, ignorant pile of shit eight years ago to the exact same in present day. To a guy locked in a storage closet, to someone who actually held himself pretty well against Buzzsaw with the amount of pressure he was under. I really thought he was going to spill, and technically I was half right with my theory by the way. 
Buzzsaw. How much I've missed you. He does get a little bit more development along with Eugene when he receives a free therapy session. And Buzzsaw's dialogue is so shamelessly ripped right from the opening page of The Complete Guide to Riding Dagger the Deranged. What were you doing up there? Ha! Gotcha! <laughs> Soil my family name over a little thing like running out of gas. Is this a new thermal? Oh, what a luxurious blend. I'm looking at you, John Telligan. Because of this, I think it's likely he'll follow a similar path and have a redemption arc of some sorts. Being as irrational and as stupid as he is, he does set himself up to potentially be one of the better characters in later seasons, and that extra bit of craziness does add a more interesting side that isn't seen in a lot of the other characters. And unlike Olivia who's almost crashed a helicopter with her son on board, and just drove a van off a cliff, again with someone else on board, I'm starting to notice a pattern here, Buster is pretty good at driving if he's able to avoid all the obstacles on the road and see through the fire and smoke. Although, can someone really be the best character if they walk up to a van leaking gas in the middle of a forest fire? Which of the kids to start with? So many choices, so little development. D'Angelo, you're up, kid. It's not my fault he took off and left you and your mom! So, we could start with the insulting of people about their fathers leaving, but for real, it has been somewhat nice to see him grow to be more accepting of being a part of a team and having a bit more of an individual personality rather than just being a rebrand of Action Man over here. It is a bit of a shame to see that one of the main characters is lacking some common sense here and there, and it definitely loses its realism at points, but he does alright. This is seen more clearly in Season 3 when he ignores Plowhorn when she is obviously trying to signal something is wrong. You can definitely see some of the most growth in Season 1 Episode 4, where he makes an effort with the other kids after talking to his mum. <laughs> Fuck it. D'Angelo is easily the most unexceptionally flat of any of the main characters, and I don't mean his body. Have you seen his fucking pecs? Every time he says anything, all I can picture are two different writers in a boardroom getting into a fist fight trying to determine who they want him to sound more like. Fish legs or snot lout, because he's pretty much a total combination of the two with absolutely no intrigue. But at the very least, he makes me laugh on rare occasions. And can someone please tell me what on earth is going on here? Why are they pushing these two so hard? June is nothing more than a whiny, irritating collection of pixels and easily my least favorite of the four kids. This next sentence probably won't make sense unless you've actually seen the show, but she has the personality of every cringe-inducing flat earther you've ever seen trying to convince you you're standing on a horizontal plane floating through space. And I'm entirely convinced that June's personality is purple. Purple eyes, purple hoodie, purple shoes. None of the mythology shit she's interested in does anything for the show. When she isn't freaking me the fuck out with her off-putting character design, she's arrogant and unmoving when someone tries to tell her anything. It's very obvious that she's the Astrid ripoff, and you could argue that Astrid was the same way in the original franchise. And yeah, Astrid was arrogant and hard-headed throughout most of it, but it wasn't for no reason. She had to be overly confident in her abilities as a warrior because if she wasn't, she was terrified something would happen to the people she cared about. Even though Astrid was flawed, she was flawed for an understandable reason, and even changed her ways to become more at peace with being unable to protect the one she loved every second of every day for the rest of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> Race to the Edge Season 2 Episode 1 Astrid's Team. Her character embodies this really interesting concept in screenwriting called depth. But it's almost as if June's writers skipped that day in script writing 101 to hang out at a flat earther convention before passing out from snorting too many bath salts. Yeah. That's the best way I can describe it. If I'm honest, out of the kids, maybe tied with Alex, she does seem to have the most reasonable response to learning about the existence of dragons, or at least seeing Thunder for the first time. I thought I'd call him Thunder. Cause lightning's too on the nose. This was a pretty good line too, and I think it helps solidify their friendship more than the exposition before, because it just feels more comfortable between them. Look at her walking. Now that's a sign of someone who hasn't had enough development in their muscles. Or from the animation team. Same goes for Tom here as well. This criticism goes for all the kids. They seem to get over seeing a dragon really quickly, let alone that they ride on one. Alex is sort of forced out of said phase because Feathers ends up in her house and she and the other kids have to try and cover in front of Hazel and Carla. But development-wise, he does seem to become more thoughtful about his actions and seems to be trying to open up a bit more about personal topics to June and Alex. But he maybe shared a little too much with D'Angelo there. Tom is probably the character with the most lost potential in my opinion. They had the chance to wring some real emotion out of him and his mother with his abandoning 
father, but it's such a non-factor so far in the show, I'm really left questioning why it was even a thing in the first place. He was much more inclined to do things by himself before, and slow to trust the other writers, and even towards June, who he's known since he was six. I really like this scene where Tom admits to not knowing what to do in a tough situation, because he shouldn't have all the answers, it'd be much too unrealistic. I... I, I don't know what to do! Aside from that, none of his motivation makes sense. He just does things for the sake of doing things. There's no clear weakness or internal conflicts happening with him. Unless you include that shit about being unable to decide whether or not to tell his mother about the dragons, which again, is such a non-factor I don't understand why it's even included. I always like to think of Tom being a discount version of Gustav, but what would really push me over though is him hitting on Astrid, but thankfully that hasn't happened yet and hopefully never will. I swear to God, Dreamer. There isn't much to say here aside from the sheer fact that Alex is the bestest of best girls. I don't know what the writers were snorting when they wrote all the other characters, but it's almost like the only sound mind, creatively motivated person in the entire crew was responsible for Alex turning out as great as she did. Alex seems to have a bit more personality tied into her physical character too, with the USB cables as hair ties, and she actually thinks things through and gives thought to decisions before carrying them out. From her first appearance, we get a clear sense of her personality, and right off the bat we see her trying to step out of her shell in an effort to impress Tom. This makes her development in Featherhide that much better when she opens up to him. She isn't just acting carelessly like the rest of the kids, there's motive behind her decisions. This scene also works really well, because you can sense the struggle and the thoughts of her going through with it. It's not easy for her, and yet she's still willing to take the chance. Later in the episode, Alex actually confides in Tom after he stays behind and gives some depth that we haven't seen before in the last 100 minutes of the show. The scene does get rushed through a bit, which I think is a shame considering it's the best thing I've seen come out of season 1, but it's nice to see some characters given some actual thought. And to give Tom some credit where it's due, I respect his character a lot for sitting down with her and talking. As we move through the episodes, we see Alex gradually become more confident and open up with the others in a somewhat organic way, although still a little rushed because of all the time constraints. A nice parallel for from their talk in Alex's dome to here is when Alex is telling Tom that he can't just be doing everything by himself. It shows that she's now more confident, and not just that, but she's also ready to confront Tom about what he's been up to as well. The band to hear that Alex has is great. Tom, it's Alex. I caught an image of something in the fissure. It looks kinda... wingy. Wingy? And all of that said, the other main characters can go suck a fat one. Moral of the story is, Alex is the one and only reason I and many other reviewers subject ourselves to two and a half hours of torture for your entertainment every few months. All the other characters can go fuck themselves with a wire brush. I'd like to thank Audrey once again for not only the shout out on my last Nine Realms video, but also for helping me with this one. Please be sure to go check out her channel on screen and below. I'll be making a season 3 video at some point in September hopefully. Audrey will also be making a full season 3 review on her channel, so be sure to look out for that. And check out her Patreon, I just did a call with her and Razorblade for our quick thoughts on season 3. It was great fun, thank you so much for having me. Anyways, thanks and good night.